So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome you to this workshop today on behalf of the Elise Action Leader, Francesco Pignatelli, on behalf of uh, who is a, a program manager at Geo Joint Research Center, on behalf of Alex Kotsev and Marco Minghini, uh, that are leading the, the activity of API and Office Spire under Elise, uh, both project officers as a, at the Joint Research Center. And on my behalf, Simon Vrechar, uh, external consultant at Joint Research Center as well, uh, who will be co-hosting uh, this uh, workshop today on smart data loader and templating for GeoServer. Maybe before we are entering into the topic, uh, as you can see on the next slide, uh, there are a few information about ELISA for those uh, you don't know uh, so much about it. So ELISA is an uh, ISA square program action. Uh, so European interoperability program, which is actually providing cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solution for public administrations, uh, businesses, and citizens. Under this, that program, there are uh, many actions, uh, 54 of them, that are tackling interoperability from different angles. And Elise is the only one that is actually focusing on the location dimension. As you can see further, uh, what is uh, Elise doing on the next slide? Uh, that uh, uh, in general, Elise Action is providing, uh, uh, from the location perspective, location interoperability perspective, policy support to different European and national uh, policy initiatives, uh, providing different interoperable cross border and cross sector solutions for public administrations, businesses, and citizens. Uh, dealing with the emerging trends and technologies and discovering how those are actually influencing to the, to the uh, geospatial developments and technologies and the other way around. And uh, last but not least, uh, building the geo knowledge um, uh, base. Uh, where uh, under which umbrella uh, performed different knowledge transfer activities, uh, which uh, uh, we will describe a bit more in details on the next slide. So uh, under the knowledge transfer activities, we are in the some engaging in an agile, agile way with different topics that are relevant to the digital transformation. And uh, we are also through, uh, through it uh, validating and sharing the results of different ELISA activities. This is done by several webinars and workshops, uh, which is also today is the case. And uh, for more information on that, because we have a quite uh, exhaustive uh, uh, list of different webinars on, and workshops, and their recordings can be found on the ELISA uh, join, up, uh, join up page. Uh, to continue today, maybe to put a bit of context, so under the ELISA action uh, uh, that has been conducting the API for Inspire study, which uh, has been actually investigating uh, new developments uh, in uh, geospatial standards and technologies, in particularly on the uh, OGC API features and sensor thing standards. And uh, this study is actually now coming to, to an end. Uh, you may, some of you may have remembered that in autumn 2020, we already organized a workshop, which was uh, more explaining uh, what, are the, what is dynamic data and why uh, it is uh, valuable for enrichment for the SDI. Today, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, try to explain how efficiently deal with the complex spatial data sources that make them useful in your daily work. And for this, uh, our speakers today, Kati Schleit uh, from uh, Datacov, Inspire, Inspire expert from Datacov, and Nuno Oliveira, expert on OGC services from GeoSolution, uh, will guide us to this workshop. Uh, I think uh, we can start, uh, let's say, discovering what would be the content of, uh, of, of the workshop. And I ask you, Kati, to provide us with the further details. Simon, thank you very, very much for this, this wonderful opportunity to present what we've been doing. So for today's workshop, I will start with an introductory block explaining what, what are these OGC API features? What is this new standard? Where did it come from? And what does it bring us? Then we will have a very short break. Then Nuno will come on and start explaining the, the exciting new functionality we've been developing under API for Inspire. The first block is the smart data loader, how to rapidly get complex data online, regardless of format. So we've got another break, and then we show you how with the feature templating, we've, we've developed a very dynamic way of getting your data online in whatever structure profile you need. So starting with OGC API features, 
And something went wrong on the animations here, Simon, thank you. Um, okay. Um, sorry that you can't quite see this one text. The, the rest of the slides I hope are better. OTC API features is basically the, the follow up for what was used, what used to be WFS2. And it was initially titled WFS3. And wait, I, I need to fix this slide. Give me one second. And then I can sanely talk on that. Um, OK, now you can see it properly. Sorry for that glitch. OK, so it's the, the follow up for WFS2. For a long time, just being bandied around as WFS3. And then at some point we realized this is going elsewhere. It was named OGC API features. It's been accepted as an inspired good practice now. You can get full information via that URL. There you have all the work that's been done on evaluating this API and figuring out how to best bring this into the inspire surrounds. There's then further supporting information available on GitHub. So more information on the good practice and also really a nice guidance document on setting up your OGC API download services. <clears throat> so if you hit the following links, you will end up with this nice document that takes you through step by step and explains you the details, what you need to do to deploy this API and provide it as an Inspire download service. Going into the details of this, so I mean, OGC API, it breaks down into several different layers. There's an underlying OGC API common, which then the various OGC APIs build on. And that's the, the bitter core of what does this standard offer? So what, does a, what is OGC API common? The standard is available from, from OGC. It's currently available on GitHub as it's still in draft mode. The, the standard is being finalized as we speak. I think the, the, the final review will be done shortly. And what does this define? It defines the very basic resources. What do you have at your API landing point? So at, at the base, base page, the slash is your landing page. Off that page, OGC API common defines that you, have, you can provide slash conformance. Under that, you provide information on all conformance classes you have implemented. So um, here, you, you again, you see it's more modular than the old OGC web services. That there it was a full or nothing. Here you can say, I'm providing OGC API and I conform to these conformance classes, but only these. So that you would provide under conformance. Under slash API, you provide the API definition. Under collections, you provide what are your various collections. This used to be the namespaces under WFS2. And within the collection, you can directly reference a collection by its collection ID. And the current encodings for that are HTML, which allow us to simply browse through an endpoint via browser. And the other alternative are JSON, JSON LD dialects, which provide us nice data pages for that. So th this is what you see if you land at the landing page in the HTML view. That's nice for us to read. We see exactly the concepts we saw under the resources. We've got the, okay, the conformance seems to have gotten lost here, but we've got the collections. We've got the various bits we need there. We've got the API definition. However, I mean, this is nice for humans. The problem is if you show that to a computer, it's not really impressed. And since we want to impress everybody, you can also provide it as JSON. And this is something which for humans is not really that nice, but your application will be very happy because it can automatically go through these links and figure out what is the next link and access it and go on with it. So the nice thing is we're now really su we're supporting both worlds. We're supporting humans and machines and trying to make everybody happy. Next concept. Links are the essence of OGC API. They are everywhere and everything links to everything and provides information about what does this link mean. So looking at the basic structure, we've got a collection and within the collection, you have the individual collections by ID. 
The collection, of course, has a hyperlink to the individual collections. The collection also has backlinks to itself, because if you have the collections HTML, you might want to be able to find the JSON encoding to then input that to your application. So the collection refers to itself via various formats. It refers to its contents via formats. And of course, the content also refer to themselves via, via various formats. And these links always have the form which is displayed at the bottom. It's very similar to what we've been used to under WFS2 under the X-Link. So what we used to have as X-Link href is here just href. You have the URL, where does it continue? The rel tells you, is, is this, what, what is the relationship of the data at that endpoint to where we are, in this case itself. So it's an, an alternative representation of the same object. But there are various self, various, various terms you can provide under the relation. The type is the classic MIME types, the Anna Media types, and finally you can provide a title. And that's provided with each of these multiple links, which are everywhere. At the same time, it is a very, very flexible standard. So, I mean, there's quite a bit defined, but almost none of it is mandatory. That's what I pointed out with the, the compliance section, in contrast to previous OGC web services where you knew it was all or nothing. Here you can in compliance say, what are you really supporting? And even providing the API description under API is not mandatory. It's recommended to use OpenAPI as the, the underlying standard. This is also not mandatory. We could provide the data in XML, we could provide it in JSON, we could provide it in something else. That's all up to us. It's all possible there. And also, again, mentioning the bit where the API description also isn't mandatory. There are many. <clears throat> there's one, one option would be that the client really works purely following the links and just it acts as a piece of data and anything it wants to find, it finds via the context off of that. Um, question is now, how, how does it then work? Again, that's where we have the conformance. Here we've got a simple conformance uh, definition and we say that this endpoint conforms to the OGC API features core, um, it conforms to open API specification version three. It conforms to the conformance class that it provides HTML and GeoJSON. And again, this is nice because it's machine actionable. And so you can look at it as a human, but your, your, your application can also understand it. And the nice thing is if you, if you actually resolve these bits, you end up being redirected to HTML pages, which then really specify the actual abstract test suite conformance class. And so here we have it for the core. Um, here we've got another one for the GeoJSON class. The rest you can, you can go through at your leisure. That's o o OGC API common core. Done. Full stop. Now going into the features. So we have the collection and the collection ID is specified in core. In features, we want to deal with individual features items. So the, the OGC API new speak for feature has now mostly become item. If you have your basic path, you have your collection and you have your collection identified. If you put slash items at the end, you will get a list of all of the features in that collection. If you add another slash and you add the ID of the item, you get that individual feature. So it's a far easier way. I mean, we could do this with WFS2. There was a get feature by ID, and I always forgot the syntax, would have to Google. Here it becomes very intuitive. You just keep going down the path and getting more specific, and you get the data that pertains to that. So that's how you reference a basic feature under OGC API features. Further bit is that at present, the only CRS that are supported are WGS84. This has to do with the fact that it's, it's fairly focused on GeoJSON. As mentioned, it can also provide XML output, 
But GOJ is currently constrained to WGS 84, and therefore there's not much we can do other than expanding GOJs. How that will work with Inspire, it seems to be accepted. A uh, further bit is that there is no mandated schema, also for a collection. A feature can be anything. It can be simple. It can be complex. It can be heterogeneous. So you have all sorts of options there. And it, it also supports everything from the simple flat features to complex features with very structured data, load, data payloads in, in addition to the geometry. Going into the details, what do we have at this slash API landing page? So normally you'd have uh, a basic information on, it's, it's usually all in Swagger. You get nice machine readable information. What various functionalities does this API endpoint support? It's structured a bit differently depending on the collection type, where we have two different approaches to providing collections. The one are uniform collections. We state the functionality is the same across all collections. We have the basic pattern as it was described in the previous slides. We have slash collections slash and the collection ID. <clears throat> all functionalities on all collections provided is the same. In some cases, you need more explicit functionality depending on your collection. And for that purpose, OGC API features has introduced the concept of distinct collections. So here we've got the example, we've got two different collections. One provides surface water quantity. The other one provides groundwater quantity. They have different queryables. This could all be described in the basic API page, describing the functionality which is available for each of these collections. So that gives you a lot of power to really specify details if you want or provide it gener generically if that works for you. This would be the landing page for a, a uniform collection where we say a collection is a collection. It has an ID, but everything else goes on the same. This is also what GeoServer is currently implementing. And there at the bottom, you've got a bit of the Swagger page and it shows you, okay, you've got, you can do get on collection slash collection ID. And in addition, we just have the generic approach of saying collections, collection ID. Under that, you, you put your slash items and get on with it and put your item feature ID and everything is generic. Alternatively, with, with the distinct collections, you actually list each individual named collection within your API landing page. Then you can provide specifics which are only available for that one collection under that section in the API description. That's it on collection types. Now going into the items. So we've got our, our named collection. The, the, the thing in the curly braces collection ID would in your path be replaced by the actual collection ID. Just to make sure that this is clear because this concept is being used continuously, the curly braces are things to be replaced. So under collection, collection ID items, you have a list of the content of the collection. This can be GeoJS a GeoJSON document, it can be GML, it can be basically what you want. And based on this, this, this content of items of the collection, you can then also do various filtering. So you can filter by bounding box, you can filter by, by temporal values. And you can filter by extra parameters defined in the API document. So here we're saying, give us all buildings which are within the bounding box, have a specific date time, and the building state is good. So that's basic access of items. Next concept we have is paging. Because as, as I mentioned earlier, with, it's a, a, a fairly different navigation paradigm for the applications. It's less that the application knows what the next page is. It doesn't have to know. It's provided in the links at the bottom of the data document. And one thing, so I mean, one, one thing we, how do, how do I explain this well? This, 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 this explanation is confused, sorry. So how, how do we navigate by these links? We, we always have a limit parameter because if you access an endpoint and say, give me everything, this could be way too much. So there's, you can either specify the limit or there's a default limit there, which can be fairly high, 
but in most cases, you will not get all of the data in one download. You will get a certain number of features. How do you get the next ones? And again, under WFS2, you had to understand the query request logic and then do the, the skipping on your own. The nice thing with OTC API is at the end, you have exactly these links. It shows you the, li the link to the current page, the previous page, the next page. And here we also see further relations. We described the, the self relation when I was explaining the basic links. So the, the middle link explains how, how do I actually find myself? Further typical relations would be previous and next. These allow for pages. And you also see in the string how we with the limit and the offset, you could manually compose this, but it's far safer to actually utilize the next links that will really get you to the next page of data. And that's basically, again, the end of what does OGC API features that do. So, I mean, it is simple, it is narrow, it is compact, but it provides the functionality we need in a simple form. For some cases, we do need extensions, but again, that's possible. One can nicely specify them in the conformance classes that we're doing. We're actually supporting extensions. Um, approach is similar to GeoPackage. There will be more and more uh, extensions coming up, providing additional functionality. Some are already in the making, such as more powerful CQL filtering, reprojection of CRS and filtering via different CRS transactions. That's all in the making and being driven by various communities. And now showing how we're using this in a real world example, we've got a nice use case from the French Geological Survey on their boreholes. So they've got a demo with almost a million boreholes and that's been available via WFS2 and was slated for WFS3. And as, as mentioned, WFS3 is now OTC API features. And here we are, and we have simple features, but far more important, we have complex features because we need them. Boreholes get complicated. So what does this look like? We have our basic landing page. You're all familiar with this bar at the right side of your geo server landing page and used to go there to get your WFS. Now in, in OTC API features enabled geo server, you will find some new links at the top and where you have features 01, if you click on that, you come to our nice uh, OTC API landing page. So that's where you again have your links to the various API definition collections. If we go on to our API definition, here we see we're using the, the uniform collection. So we've got the, the landing page, we've got some conformance, we serve collections, we serve them by ID, and under the collections we have items and they're also by ID. This is what you find under the basic API landing page. Going on to our collections, so in this case, we have two different views on boreholes. Again, the back to the point earlier, the problem with complex features is they're complex. And sometimes we need them because we need all the details. Sometimes they really get in, in our way because we really just want a simple view. And that's also the core of then the follow-up of this presentation showing how we can take the same data set provided as a complex borehole representation and then a very simple representation just for view purposes. Now going into an individual collection, here we've got the borehole itself. There you see the feature sch schema, so you see what attributes does this feature type contain. And if you want to access it, you can access the pull down, uh, specify what what response format do you want? So under the assumption we're selecting GeoJSON, we then get our nice page with our individual items. And that's basically what we can do. So what have we done with this? I mean, explain to date is what, what is the functionality from OGC API features. Now our challenge has been how do we really make the best of it. And how do we use this to sort of 
take what we have and bring this into the future. So taking one step back, this is where most of us are. We, we have our various data sources, we have that mapped out to various servers, have that, at least in our case, usually in GeoServer, have that mapped to our feature type, provide that to, via WFS and WMS and everything is good. And what do we do with all of this existing stuff? So we need to keep that cleanly on the radar and also looking at how we've been doing that. I mean, we've been, do, we've been doing a lot of app schema configuration and there's been a lot of really hard work mapping all of the original source data via some simple features and app schema and the GML schemas and finally coming out to the complex features. But I mean, the cool thing with OGC API now is that we map it once and we get all of the, these output formats. So the first real step we've made is by opening up our existing configuration, so OGC API. One endpoint can provide GML, it can provide GeoJSON. If we're nice, it can provide uh, JSON-LD, shapefiles, all of this stuff. But the really trick, the, the, the painful bit is the basic mapping between the data and the target schema. And this is what has been costing vast amounts of resources in institutions across Europe, doing all of the nitty gritty details. And the other problem is that the app schema mapping, anybody who has worked with this, it, when it works, it works beautifully, but until it works, that's where I've gotten most of my gray hairs. So how do we make this easier? And there we had the idea of why don't we use some sort of templating? What you see is what you get. Provide a simple piece of JSON, provide what the source data is and let GeoServer do, do some magic. So on the, on the top right, you see a, a simple template file where it, it basically looks like a normal JSON file Everything which is somewhere standardized, a constant is just put in quotes that gets passed through one to one. Every piece of, of data which needs to be input from the original data source. If you have it mapped, you just provide the, the, the relative X path where the content would be in your JSON file. So here we're saying the type is lifecycle information that's a constant. This type is time instant, that's a constant. The actual time, whoops, that's under the original source E plus B update date GML time instant time position. And if we do the template like this, it then inserts the actual value. And so that's how we've come from taking this template and allowing it to generate this GeoJSON based on an existing endpoint. And here we have it for the normal GeoJSON data content. The same thing can also be done with the geometry. There you can also add your various functions. And based on that, we again provide nicely the point geometry as required. So this, this allows us to take existing XML endpoints and create very nice uh, GeoJSON facades over it. But it gets even better that I know what one of the, the major headaches of environmental data providers is that each community tends to have their own community profile. And the one wants a simple view, the other one wants a different simple view because the one wants the attribute A added and the other one wants B, but they don't want to see each other's attributes because that would be data overloading. So we need, we need to constantly create different profiles. And so, I mean, here we've got a simple example from, again, the E plus boreholes versus, I'm not quite sure what, it's a simple geo representation. And it's both representing the elevation of a point. But the one system wants a simple flat list, the other one wants just the little details. And how do we provide both of these? It's far easier to just map the data out, expose the data once, and then do the quick templating in the two different flavorings. So starting with the 
the complex one from E plus B, where they want all the details. We create this, this simple mapping file, insert it into the geo server, and get the output there. And then for the other one, we do a second mapping, and that goes its way. So it's really a beautiful way of exposing the same data source in different profiles as required by different communities. Final bit is filtering. It, provide, it, it supports full CQL filtering. And so you can say, give, give me all boreholes where the length is greater than 83. And that will just select those boreholes. I've done another one on the, the COVID initiatives database where I can say, give me all initiatives where they, that, that provide the 24 hour case data and that returns the data. So that is the very quick introduction into OGC API features as well as where we're taking it. And before we go into our first short break, I would like to bother you with a short survey. Sorry for the bother, but we need this for our project. So I would request you all to go to that survey page. Get that set up on your machines. I will at the same time set up the page where I can then show you our survey. So could we please go to the first question? Simon, short qu side question while we're waiting, how many participants do we have so I can gauge as of when the audience has been good? At the moment, 68 are here. <clears throat> so three quarters of our audience isn't answering yet. <laughs> Okay, but this looks quite positive. Okay, so it seems that everybody is fairly happy with the available documentation on OGC API. So going on to the next question. What further documentation would you require? Is it possible to answer to this or are there issues with the way I'm running the presentation? Thank you. Okay, examples, we definitely need examples. Okay, this is, this is very good input because I mean, this, this we can provide to the European Commission of what is missing. 
this is the audience chance to provide some feedback which might make something happen. So if you're not if you're not complaining here, please don't complain afterwards. Okay, I'm again going to assume things are quieting down, but what up oh, somebody else is answering, then I will give you a bit more time. Okay, but it's nice how examples and more examples are staying in the center. Okay, I will go on to the next slide. I think you can still enter data after I've passed it. So if you have more ideas, please enter them. I will download this after the workshop. And if you have further ideas tonight falling asleep, send us a mail tomorrow and we'll try and slip it in. So next slide. Could you find relevant example requests? Okay, now we're seeing where the examples are coming from. It'd be interesting where the ones who did find them find found it. Okay, and based on our general, oh, usually we have, haven't gotten up to 30 responses. So I'll wait a tiny bit more. Okay, that seems to be stabilized. There, there I'd say we're, we're almost half half. So half of you are better at finding it than, than I am. I, I, I admit I was challenged looking for the examples. So for those of you who couldn't find them, you're in good company, I think. Uh, next slide. Could you find relevant data in coding examples? Okay, well, I see encoding is really going to be one of the big next challenges. <laughs> I admit everything I have found to date is self contradictory. Okay, this is definitely a point where we have our work cut out for us. I'm going to continue on because after 24 no's, if anybody wants to say yes, do so now. Okay, we've, we've, we've got an issue, nice. Um, how intuitively usable do you see the, the API? Okay, so the basic usability seems to be okay. It's just the issue of what do we really provide with this nice thing? 
but I'm, I'm very much hoping after the second two sections, you will have a far better idea of this. So there, there is still hope and we do have our homework cut out for us providing more examples. Okay, I'm gonna say ba basically the overall feedback is good. Based, based on the use cases you are re regularly dealing with, could, could, you, could you implement your use cases with OGC API features? Okay, but it seems with the basic API functionality, y'all are happy. The issue pertains to what, what is really provided in what format. It'd be interesting in getting some feedback on who can't implement their bits with OGC API features. I, I fear I don't have a, a slide on that there would be interesting to really see what issues you've identified. Okay, I'd say the response on that is settling. No, 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 still a few people being ambitious. Okay, th three quarters of the audience is at least convinced that they can use this and the one quarter we'll have to get in touch with and see what is missing and how do we make that better. Is the overhead involved acceptable? Well, by you could probably answer that better after Nuno is done. <laughs> And the other nice thing is we all have the old OGC web services to compare it to, so it is easier. So do the, the, the seven regular voters who, six, five, okay. Just making sure that nobody's embarrassed to say no. Ha. <laughs> it's nice to see that that option also works on this slide. Okay, I'm assuming that everybody who has voted, who wants to vote, has voted. That's the end of the survey for the first part. I would now hand over, actually, no, now we have a short five minute break. I think I need to again change presentations. Exactly. We've got a five minute buyer break, and then Nuno will start with the real nitty gritty of how to work with the smart data loader, as well as then how to continue off with smart templating and modify your data into any format profile you want. 